commercial or financial information that the board has received from a business prospect or deliberation of the offer of a financial or other incentive to a business prospect and or to consult with legal counsel regarding pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offer or on a matter which the school district's legal counsel determines should be confidential including student transfer appeals as identified in items 4.2 through 4.7 herein term contract non-renewal hearing options and related procedures, and the Level 3 community member complaint identified in Items 6 and 8 herein. In accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, Sections 551 551.074, 551.072, 551.073, 551.087, 551.087, 551.0821, 551.0821, and 551.0821, respectively. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. Second. Second by Mr. Snyder. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes unanimously by all those on the dais. Uh, let me check. Okay. Um, at this time, the board will move to, let's, uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Moya, would you go ahead and uh, lead us in the pledge? Public for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. On the Texas flag, pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. And we will move to the level three grievance of Swanson and Martinez. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for waiting. I once again I apologize for the late hour. The board is meeting to hear and consider the grievance brought by Steve Swanson and Robert Martinez. Uh, the following board members are here at this time. Um, Ms. Tamela Barksdale, Mr. Robert Schneider, Ms. Amber Ellens, Ms. Gina Nahosa, Ms. Ann Teich, Ms. Lori Moya, Ms. Cheryl Bradley, and myself, Vincent Torres. Chris Elizaldi is present as legal counsel to the board. Would the parties please introduce themselves? Uh, first. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Brian McGivern. I'm an attorney. I'm here on behalf of uh, Steve Swanson and Robert Martinez. And would you introduce the other members in your party? Uh, of course. Um, Tony Rayner, um, Laurie Barzana, and Leland Butler. Leland Butler. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Beekler. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, outline the process of this hearing, but, but first I need to make clear that we are, but first I need to make clear what we are considering tonight. We are reviewing a decision at the administrative <laughs> level that this grievance was untimely filed under the Austin ISD public complaints policy, GF local. About the process, the board's responsibility is to hear the grievance presentation to hear from the administration, and then to determine what action, if any, to take regarding the grievance. The board has been provided copies of the extensive grievance record and documents submitted by the parties. We have had the opportunity to review the documents. Consideration of additional information or arguments not presented previously in the record should not be considered. Mr. Swanson and Mr. Martinez, represented, represented by Mr. McGivern, will proceed first to make a presentation not to exceed a total of 20 minutes. Then the administration will be allowed to make a presentation not to exceed a total of 20 minutes. Uh, Trustee Lori Moya will keep time. Ms. Moya, would you raise your hand? Um, this is an informal presentation proceeding, not a trial or evidentiary hearing. The parties will not ask questions of one another. There will be no witness testimony and no cross-examination. The board will listen to each of you, and we may ask clarification questions after the presentations are completed. Each side will then have up to three minutes for closing remarks. This hearing is being recorded, so please do not talk over one another so that we can keep an accurate record. When the presentations and board's questions, if any, are concluded, the board will deliberate. If necessary, we may go into closed session to consult with board counsel on any legal questions we have. The board's decision will be rendered in open session. 
Are there any questions regarding the procedures? Okay. Mr. McGivern, you have 20 minutes. Do you want the board, do you want Ms. Moya to let you know when you're approaching the end of your time? That would be great. I'm sorry? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, five minutes, two minutes? Uh, let's say three. Three minutes. Okay, Ms. Moya, when three minutes re remaining, would you please let Mr. McGivern know? Ms. Moya, are you ready? Mr. McGivern, are you ready? Okay, Mr. McGivern, you may begin. I assume, yes, this is amplifying my voice. I'm a notorious quiet talker. My name is Brian McGivern. I'm an attorney. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, by way of, of context, the grievance that you're hearing here today is part of a larger project to try to ensure, um, to try to bring to life the rights that are already embodied within the Texas, within Texas law. Uh, in this case, uh, the right of schools and communities to be part of planning for their own future. In other words, to have a voice. Um, I think there have been several examples in the past, in past years of instances in which local communities' voices have not been heard. And on that point, I think the example of East 7 Memorial High School is actually an ironic one. Until recently, I think it would have been regarded as um, the most obvious and maybe egregious example of an instance in which a community was not being heard. And yet, uh, in the recent months, uh, it's become obvious it's taking a new direction and may actually serve as a model for the opposite. And that's what we want for every school. And that's all by way of context. Um, this complaint was born in a uh, time before in uh, an old world um, through not listening. Uh, Steve and Robert are the complainants here. Um, I think it's fair to wager most or all of you know who they are. They've been involved with advocacy on behalf of students, on behalf of students, for years. Um, the complaint was born because about a year ago, they wanted to share thoughts and concerns that they had with the board. They began by informally requesting the opportunity to speak to the board. Um, what they heard back was maybe, maybe, wait, and so ultimately what they did was they came to a board meeting, um, not like this one because there was citizens communication, but they, they used that opportunity to ask for an opportunity to speak to the board in a, in a unit of time greater than two minutes. Um, that was on September the 24th of that year. They asked to hear some response of any sort um, by the end of the week, five days later, which would have been the 28th, and they didn't hear one. This complaint was filed on October the 11th, and although I always check my math three times, because if I'd been good at math, I wouldn't have gone to law school, each of those dates, even the earlier date, the 24th, where they asked for the opportunity to speak in a segment of time greater than two minutes, uh, would be well within 15 business days required for timeliness under this provision. But what if it wasn't timely? It's an interesting topic. You're going to hear a lot about that. And the most important word in the policy is the word may. In the policy in question, it talks about untimely filings. It says if it's determined that a file, I'm paraphrasing, a filing is untimely, it may be dismissed at any point in the proceedings. It may be dismissed. Now, you're, you're going to see a flood of case law about the full scope of your power to dismiss claims that you feel are untimely. Um, but it's really beside the point. It's not required. It, a complaint may be dismissed. Um, just as an aside, you're, I'm sure I anticipate you're going to hear a lot about uh, this also being a jurisdictional question. Uh, there is plenty of case law that uses the word jurisdictional for administrative complaints. It doesn't apply to this proceeding with the Board of Trustees. Uh, without boring you, the case law says that before a case can be presented in a civil court of law, that administrative remedies like this must be exhausted. It doesn't say anything about exhaustion before talking to a board of trustees. And I like to think that, you know, we're capable of accomplishing something without resorting to courts. So if it's not jurisdictional, if it's not required, what is it? Well, it's prudential. 
It's a policy that often works but doesn't have to be strictly applied. It's a policy where you, know, you look at considerations like fairness, is it fair in this instance? Is it efficient? Fairness and efficiency. I believe that this complaint was timely, but even if you disagree with me, I think you will agree that applying it in this instance would be a technicality. It wouldn't be an issue of fairness. Now, fairness seems, um, it makes sense to me when you're dealing with a case that involves a grievance against a teacher or an administrator or a principal or any other individual person. But I think it's clear if you look at my counsel's table, there's no client there with him. I mean, this is a complaint against the district. I mean, it's another way of saying, this is, are these people petitioning their government, all right? I mean, there's no person that needs to be protected against an unjust claim that was brought too late in time for them to defend themselves. Um, frankly, if it's dismissed on, on timeliness, the technicality of a few days, it's going to be a cop-out. I mean, forgive my presumption, but I doubt anyone believes that they were elected for the purposes of dismissing relevant issues on technicalities, a cop-out. So it's not about fairness. Timeliness in this instance, it's not about fairness. There's the other factor, is it factor, excuse me. Is it efficient? Well, let me tell you. What we're complaining about here, failures to really talk to a community, uh, work with the community, listen to a community when making decisions. Um, a lot of people would argue that happens every day. Now, I'm not talking about the ongoing harm argument within timeliness. That's a separate issue. What I'm saying is there are a lot of people out there who are in circumstances frequently when they can file complaints. And frankly, when you're considering whether or not it'd be efficient to ignore the merits of this claim and dismiss it as untimely, should you believe that it's untimely? Keep in mind that if a person was of a mind to, they could come back here with 12, a dozen different complaints for you on every individual nuance of the issues involved here. Um, I don't think that dismissing a claim like this on a technicality is an efficient use of your time. I think that all that would accomplish, all the, all the fighting that would come after, it would accomplish a lot of, uh, get a lot of attention might make people angry. I think it would generate a lot of heat without a lot of light. I don't think that it's an efficient use of your time. Now, hearing, it, hearing this on the merits, even if you should believe that it's untimely, which it's not, hearing it on the merits would be easy. Uh, it'd be easy to hear and easy to agree. Because, you know, as I said in my brief, the things that are being asked for, the School Community Bill of Rights, that list, that's a list of things the district already said that they could do. That came from Mel Waxler's pen. In fact, he promised that it would happen. And it's not that I don't believe Mr. Waxler. Um, I found him to be a very nice and gracious person, actually. Um, but what we were hoping for was to, you know, really make that promise real, to make it real. Um, to make sure it's not lost in the shuffle, to make sure it's not, you know, put with the best of intentions, put on a shelf somewhere, ultimately only to gather dust. Um, we just want those promises, which the district said it could do, which it promised it would do, brought to life and actually just put into policy so that it's done. Now, I could talk an awful lot, but really this complaint is about Steve and Robert wanting an opportunity to talk and being ignored. And they have something to add about the issue of timeliness in this case. I'd like to give them the opportunity to speak if y'all don't object. Robert? Uh, my name is Robert Martinez. I'm primarily here as a community advocate or concerned community person. Thank you for hearing our concerns. I want to talk to you about the importance of community, the importance of working with the community to meet the needs of our children. How adopting the Community Bill of Rights is an important and necessary for first step to make it happen. My concern has been to help those struggling kids to do better in their school education. 
I believe in that if school educators would work close with the parents and the students and with the community, then many more children would be helped in their education world. And your leadership is vital, important to make it happen. For many years, I have been concerned with the education of all our children, particularly for the ASD district, school district. My four children attended Pierce Middle School and graduated from LBJ High School. So as I looked into how I could help, especially the struggling children, I became aware that the school district in their educational efforts was not addressing the total needs of all of the children. While I believe that the primary purpose of our public school is to teach all of our children the basic elements of reading, writing, and arithmetic, I believe we need to look deeper at the learning process, the learning process of each child. We know and have learned the other factors can be obstacles in the learning process of children. I believe very strongly in the value of public education which has allowed millions of children in America to receive good education, regardless of their economic status. So when I learned from a first grade teacher some 15 years ago that over half of our ch ch children came to school sleepy, hungry, and scared, I realized that there are many obstacles that, come, that prevent our children and from learning, and they, they come from the home environment, in which case I know that the schools have limited control. However, if the community around the schools <clears throat> can work with the parents and businesses and religious institutions, if they could come together to help each other and work together, and working with the teachers and the school educators, that home environment could be helped, and it would help those children. I believe that would help most children to, to come to school ready to learn. The school system could play a role in making this happen. So with that in mind, I found that the Texas Education Code requires each school campus to have decision-making committees where parents, teachers, and community leaders can work together to improve the learning environment of the schools. And you have those campus advisory councils now in each school, and they could create that nurturing learning environment, in, environment if they were operated for the law, which is to be decision-making committees. It is vital that each campus be creating for our children that safe, nurturing, learning environment. And so for the past seven years, Steve and I have, and others have been talking to school board members, to city and county officials, elected officials, and to state legislators to try to create that training and implement those programs where parents and teachers and community leaders can learn to work together for the betterment of all our children. At our own expense, Steve and I and others went to Denver, Colorado three years ago to look at their restorative justice program that restores the child in the school and not have to be involved with the core judicial system. We know that educating our children is a difficult and complex endeavor. We know that the learning process is influenced by the attitude attitude and ability of each child, which is greatly influenced by the family and home environment and their experiences. But for our community to, to not, a community to not get organized to commit to help their children education is sad, frustrating, and it's discouraging. It is sad especially to when the community has the capacity and the resources such as Austin. 
while a few of the ISD schools have experienced success in addressing, addressing many of the student needs, there are many, many more schools that need to do, the, to do so. So we are at a crossroad. Do you elected board members commit yourself to implement training and resources to help more of the children experience a safe, nurturing learning environment at their schools? We're not looking for an agreement to these agreed principles because we have received that for the last seven years. We're looking for you to commit to adopt policies that requires the schools educators to work closely in partnership with parents, community leaders, and businesses to make it happen and help all our children. For the current policy of the Campus Advisory Council as being operating is strictly advisory and not decision making as required by the Texas Education Law Code. And therefore, it is not creating that safe, nurturing, and learning environment that our children need. So if you want it to happen, you will have to have the will, the compassion, the drive, and the desire, and the commitment to approve whatever policy and provide whatever necessary resources that you have to make it happen. I believe the Bill of Rights presented here is an easy and powerful first step. I would hope and pray that the majority of you board members have that compassion, that drive, that desire, and that will to commit to adopt and implement the, that policy to make it happen. That is for the parents and the teachers and the community leaders and businesses to work together for the betterment of, of the kids, our kids' education. For nothing would please me more nor warm my heart more than to see thousands more children, our students, attending a school campus where they feel safe, nurtured, three minutes, and are enjoying their learning experience. Nothing would please me more. Thank you. Well, my three minutes, I'll tell you, I've got it all written out just in case these guys would take too long. Um, but one thing they did not point out is that um, prior to December t uh, 2012, I'll, I'll go to my notes there, uh, we had uh, never heard or seen an uh, AISD board president state publicly that community engagement is important. Prior to December 2012, we'd never seen or heard board members take action themselves to start community engagement like they did at Eastside Memorial at Johnston. Before December of 2012, we've never heard nor seen board members unanimously vote to support students at Eastside Memorial. Community processes to obtain community engagement help for the school. And, most recently, to have a plan requiring representatives from the CACs and others to report regularly and directly to the board. This should happen often and, and, and for a variety of many schools. Uh, we never heard uh, about board members starting a committee on community engagement and resurrecting the 2008 report uh, by the Neighborhoods and Schools Committee. And we never heard of seeing board members write to and meet with their commissioner nor the commissioner, uh, uh, the commissioner of education. And, and um, seeing the commissioner of education and the superintendent publicly acknowledge the leadership and courage of students at Eastside Memorial Johnston that helped bring change for a new but old way of leadership community-based. And before today, we had never had the state legislature require districts to grade their community and student engagements A through F. So you guys are already off from a very low grade to a very high grade, and we want to encourage you that. I've got some information I'd like to share with you in a package here. It's something we've put together the last four or five years that's based upon the code. It's based upon our presentations. We make presentations statewide with the University of Texas uh, former um, uh, professor. 
And I'd, I'd like to give it to you because it builds upon the work you've already done. And it also tells a story that started in 1996 when AISD convened during the bond program. Community engagement uh, brought the city, the county, and the school district along with a very diverse group of business people for the purpose of improving opportunity for minority business in the building of schools. It was relationship-based. And, and profound things happen because of that is the foundation for my belief that, that we can do it and will do it. Um, again, I add my encouragement to, uh, to bring the, the, the School Community Bill of Rights uh, to life. Uh, I'm grateful that Time. the administration uh, offered the, the idea, I, items in it. And thank thank you. you for this time. Mr. Beek, sir. You have, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Yeah, it's all right. You have 20 minutes. Do you want Trustee Moya to let you know when you are approaching the end of your time? Uh, yes, sir. If uh, at maybe at 15 minutes with five minutes left, that would be 15 good. and five. Uh, yes. Okay. At 15 and five? No, just at, at, at five. five minutes left. Okay. Five. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Are you ready to begin? I am ready to proceed. You may begin, Mr. Beach or Ms. Moya. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Torres, members of the board, uh, Ms. Elizalde. Uh, my name is Bill Beekler. Um, I am an attorney here in Austin, and I've been practicing school law for, I just started my 25th year of practicing education law. Uh, so I'm honored to be here tonight, and I'm privileged to be uh, representing the administration in this appeal regarding the, the timeliness of the, uh, the grievance as to when it was originally filed. Um, I want to start with a few comments with respect to the, the nature of this grievance and how it has proceeded to date through level one, <clears throat> excuse me, level one and level two. Uh, first of all, it has not been a, a contentious type of litigious grievance, which I've enjoyed. Uh, the conflict hasn't been there. And I, I appreciate the efforts of Mr. Swanson, uh, Mr. Martinez, the, the witnesses that appeared at level one and level two. Uh, Mr. Gip McGivern with his uh, professionalism as, as we've gone through this. Because I think at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We all want what is best for AISD students, but we're just going down two different paths. And so what I'm here to talk to you tonight is about the policy, policy uh, GF local, dealing with grievances and timeliness. What occurred at level two is Mr. Waxler was level two hearing officer, and the appeal was dismissed based on timeliness. A review of the facts were held and then the appeal was dismissed on, on timeliness. So what we are asking on the administration's behalf tonight is that the board uphold that decision at level two and affirm that the appeal was untimely and therefore needs to be dismissed. What we're looking at from the administration standpoint is is a process and it's a process that's been in place for a long time with school districts all over the state of Texas. There are 1,000 something school districts in the state of Texas. Most of us follow the TASB uniform policies. So this, this policy has been around a long time, this 15 day policy that we're talking about. In this context, since we had members of the community involved, it was, it rose under policy GF. But policy DGBA, which deals with employees, and policy FNG, which deals with uh, students and parents, all follow the same 15-day time frame. And the level one, level two, level three up in, in front of the board. And like I said before, most school districts around the state of, of Texas follow the same policy. So there are a lot of determinations out there by the courts and by the commissioner of education with respect to how we interpret that policy and what the meaning of the policy is. So uh, Mr. McGivern stated that it's not jurisdictional. Jurisdictional is a court uh, type of concept. I, I disagree with that. And there are a couple of cases in your, in your binder. Uh, the Salinas versus McAllen ISD case, the Isleta ISD case, and then there's the Van Independent School District case, which was at the Texas Supreme Court in 2005 and specifically dealt, all these cases specifically deal with this 15-day time frame, and they do say it is jurisdictional. So it's important, and I'll get into the reasons for that in a minute, why it's important to follow these jurisdictional precedents in uh, the application of the, the policy in this uh, circumstance. Now, with that all being said, and without waiving these jurisdictional 
issues. I want to talk to you all a minute about what happened informally here because it's, it's important. If you look, and it's in the record, when the, uh, the, the complainants did their brief at level three, and you all uh, know have had an opportunity to review that, the very first thing that is said there is that the petitioners, Mr. Swanson and Mr. Martinez, respectfully ask the board to institutionalize into district policy simple but essential procedural protections to ensure the public's right to participate in campus-based planning will be respected in the future. The protections petitioners seek have already been recommended by district staff during the complaint process, but those recommendations will be worthless, easily ignored and discarded unless they are explicitly set forth in district policy. So what occurred in this, this was a unique grievance at level one uh, and at level two, we heard probably up to nine to 10 hours worth of testimony and exhibits, which is unique for the grievance process. So there was quite a bit of an opportunity to have a work session and address these issues. When Mr. Waxler uh, handed down the decision on the grievance process and said it was untimely, he also made some informal findings that dealt with the issues that the grievance had brought forward not as part of the grievance process because it was untimely, but as part of working with the community. Recently, those recommendations were put into administrative recommendations, uh, or excuse me, regulations under BQB, which follows with the policy. So what is being asked for here, just uh, when you get to the merits, is that those recommendations basically be made part of district policy, where they are administrative regulations, which help interpret policy. So from the informal side, I just wanted to mention that I think that's important for the record that you all are aware that that is going on. Now, let's go back on the, on the grievance side of this, what our complaint form says. And I, in the, the PowerPoint you see in front of you, I have GF, uh, DGBA, and FNG because it all follows the same language. It says, within 15 days of the date the individual first knew or with reasonable diligence should have known of the decision or action giving rise to the complaint or grievance. That's when the complaint form must be filed with the lowest level administrator. Okay, so let's, what important dates do we, do we have here? The, when you just look at the face of the document on the level one uh, grievance that was filed, it was filed on October 11th of 2012. That's the, the date that it was officially filed. So if you count 15, business days back from there, you have to look at September 20th of 2012. So if the complainants first knew or with reasonable diligence should have known of events giving rise to complaints prior to September 20th, then the filing by our policy is untimely. It's going to be untimely. So if they knew of any of these events prior to September 20th of 2012, then by policy it is untimely. The policy also says that if the complaint form is not timely filed, the complaint may be dismissed on written notice to the individual at any point during the complaint process. And I agree with Mr. McGivern, it says may. It doesn't say shall, it says it may be dismissed at any point, uh, point during the complaint process and that the appeal is limited to the issue of timeliness and that's what we're dealing with here tonight. There are some legal, some legal authority that you need to be aware of. I've already mentioned a couple of these cases, but some of this refutes what was set forth in the complainant's um, a brief dealing with these timeliness issues. First of all, when we do these types of hearings, if you've done these before, again, in the employee context, the student complex, I know you've been through that, it's a stop, look, and listen hearing. And the reason I mention that it's a stop, look, and listen type hearing is because all the board is required to do, all administrators are required to do is stop and listen to the complaint as it's presented. There's no requirement that action be taken. But in that same context, is, uh, uh, when President Torres read the rules for this hearing, there is no cross-examination. We don't have discovery. We don't have anything like that. So when we're listening from the administration standpoint, Due process flows both ways. You have to be able to investigate allegations that are made. You have to be able to respond to allegations that are made. And what you have here is you review some of the record and the tapes that we have, the considerable amount of tape that we have. Some of these issues go back to 2003, 2005, prior administrations, prior uh, uh, um, superintendents. There's no way that you can go back and review that, investigate, and defend that in this, this process, in this stop, look, and listen type process. And even courts have 
uh, statute of limitations. And the reason they have that is because things change, witnesses disappear, and all that type of thing. So that's one of the reasons that you have a stop, look, and listen hearing, and that's why you have a 15-day time frame, because you want to be moving forward and dealing with what's in front of us. As I said, the, the, the law is pretty clear. The commissioner, as you all know, interprets Texas school laws. Those, appe those appeals can be taken into court. There's, it goes back to 1926, I believe, that these time frames are jurisdictional. When we're dealing with uh, what has to happen within the school context, it's jurisdictional before uh, courts can consider it. Um, and that's been incorporated into these various policies. One other thing that uh, it was brought up at the level two is that, well, it's a continuing violation. So if you're going back to Eastside Memorial issues, from uh, 2011, the AIM truancy issues from 2011, the, they're continuing type violations. Well, the commissioner in the Isleta case, and that's in the, uh, in the record, it's part D tab four, that case is in there and the language is very clear in there, that this continuing violation type um, doctrine does not apply in the school grievance context. Uh, and then finally, the fact that evidence is presented at a lower level. So th there was a considerable amount of evidence presented at level one and level two. And that's okay. Because sometimes you need to hear that evidence to flesh out, well, do we even have a timeliness issue? Courts dismiss matters all the time after a full trial. You can have a six-month trial, it can go to the Court of Appeals, and it gets dismissed on a jurisdictional issue. Because if the court or the initial uh, forum did not have jurisdiction to hear the matter, then it never should have been heard in the first place. But sometimes that evidence needs to come out to make that determination as to uh, whether it's jurisdictional anyway. And like I said, it came, became a work session. Uh, you had a lot of uh, top administrators within the district working on these solutions. Um, and it came out in the informal memo, now in the administrative regulations. You had a lot of people, a lot of man hour, uh, went into coming up with these types of solutions to make the process better for, for uh, students. All right, now uh, just to cite to some of the record, the plaintiff's filing was un untimely. There are several things here. One, and it, this is set forth in the level one complaint. It talks about an informal letter sent to the board in August of 2012. There's been some discussion here that a deadline or the, that they came to, the uh, grievance came to the board in, on September 24th and there was the September 28th comes to mind. But in the actual letter, which is dated August 8th, which several of you received if you were on the board at that time, um, it, it put different time frames. It set a deadline of August 26th to meet and respond to the, uh, to meet and to respond to the request to meet by August 18th. So there on its face, and this is set forth in the level one complaint, which Mr. Waxler relied on, on its face it's untimely. Remember what the policy says, you first knew or with reasonable diligence should have known. So on its face there. The videotape testimony that is part of the record, um, at level one we had an opportunity to review that and a lot of the, the folks here uh, gave video testimony in that regard. It's all prior to September 20th of, of 2012. Um, the decision in meetings uh, involving the, the idea in district charters, as you all well know, goes back to 2011. AIM Truancy, a pilot program at Eastside Memorial at Johnston was 2011 also. So, it, I mean, these aren't something that is a technicality or that we're within a few days of. The issues that were brought up through these proceedings date back a lot of times over a year prior to when the grievance were filed and sometimes when the grievance was filed, excuse me. And some of it goes back even farther than that. So why, uh, why is that important? Okay. It's easy to say, well, just waive the 15-day time frame, that we don't have to follow that, as the board doesn't have to follow that. Well, as I said, the commissioner has upheld that, the courts have upheld the 15-day time frame, because you want to move forward with issues. In the school context, we're not looking back a year or two years down the road. Everything moves quickly. You have quarters, you have semesters, you have one, uh, school years, you have budget years. You need to be moving forward as opposed to backward and reviewing things that, that move back. And like I said, initially, when you're dealing with the 15-day time frame, 
uh, one of the one of the issues you have is the ability to investigate to make a determination as to whether an allegation is valid or not. The duty is to stop, look, and listen. But most administrators want to review the situation, investigate, and see if there's any validity to uh, the, the claim. Um, we want to stay consistent with other school-related timelines. If an employee is proposed for non-renewal, they have 15 days to, re to request a hearing. You, as a board, have to give employees a notice of a proposed non-renewal 10 days before the last day of instruction. So you don't have time frames that go for 30 days, for 45 days, for a year. This isn't a court uh, forum. Okay? It, we want to stay consistent with the, the numbers that uh, were out there. And we want to stay consistent in terms of, of precedent. Um, one thing over the years that I've learned, and it's, and it's always when, when I'm in a situation where I'm advising a board, is to stay consistent with the application of your policies. So for example, if the, this board were con to remand this back to level two for consideration of the merits, and we're dealing with things that happened in 2011, 2010, 2009, what happens when one of your principals is faced with a, 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 a grievance under DGBA from a teacher who says, well, Five I want to grieve, thank you, uh, I want to grieve a poor appraisal I got two years ago. What do we say in that circumstance? Or what do we say if a parent moves forward and says we want to complain about something that happened two years ago, a year ago, three years ago? Okay. That's not saying that people don't have a valid discussion to bring forward. We're talking about a process, though. We're talking about the grievance process versus another path for accomplishing the same means. But if we start straying from what our policy says in that 15-day time frame and we start allowing exceptions, that, for the most part, becomes a policy because the board, by its actions, can create policy. Everything doesn't always have to be written down, and there's plenty of cases that will say that sometimes individual actions will result in a policy for the school district. So we need to be, it's, it's efficiency. Again, it's moving forward, and we need to be careful of creating an exception in this circumstance, particularly since we know that informally the issues have been dealt with, and there's been a, a good discussion, and I want to, want to reiterate that. So um, unless board members have questions at this time, that's all I've got, which is pretty good for a lawyer that I got that in within 20 minutes. I always say I can, but that rarely happens. Uh, I thank you for uh, your time and attention. And if, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you. OK, at this time, board, are there any clarifying questions from any of the board members? or any of the parties. Okay, it doesn't look like, oh, Ms. Barksdale, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, for your team, I think I'm not clear on your timeline. I have a very good idea of the response to the timeline issues, but I'm not sure about what you're saying was the, was the aggrieving event and the timeline associated with that event in terms of the timeliness of the complaint. The event was the request to speak to the Board of, of Trustees, um, okay? Now, the content of that discussion is something that we talked about during the hearing, or the, the discussion that they wanted to have was certainly something that we spoke about during the hearings, something that you heard about a bit tonight. The relevance of that is that it clarifies what they wanted to talk about, what their purpose was. It wasn't frivolous. It was um, a matter of some importance, and so it, it goes to, um, not the weight, but the, the urgency with which they sought that meeting and, um, and all that. The grieving event was asking to speak to the Board of Trustees, have an opportunity to do that in something greater than a two-minute segment, and getting nothing but silence in return. And what was, so the, what date was that? They spoke here and asked for the opportunity to um, speak at a longer interval on September, um, 24th. September 24th? Yes, ma'am.
and the complaint was filed on October the 11th. But I think you two are not in agreement on what the aggrieving event was. Is that the case? Um, I think that's a fair characterization. Okay. I'm reluctant to say what my. To so there was, a ver there was a verbal request on September 25th and citizens' communication to speak with the board. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you believe that the letter that was sent previous to that, I think it was in August, is not part of this complaint? Uh, no, I mean, I, th I think a verbal request to speak to the board at, at some greater length than what's typically allowed is kind of a distinct event. Okay, that supersedes the letter that was that to the board to, to meet with, talk with the board. I, I wouldn't say supersede. I'd say it's, it's kind of similar, but it's distinct and different. Okay, okay. That's, that's it. Thank you for now. Mr. Schneider, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I did. It was basically similar to the question Ms. Barksdale raised. Um, but I'm also having a little bit of difficulty in that I've noticed that at the level one complaint, there were some things that were denied on the basis of time, but there were others that were uh, acknowledged in some way, some of which did not even get explicit uh, at least my reading of it did not say that there were explicit uh, remedies that were provided. Um, basically, we're going to look into it. Uh, came close a couple of times. Um, but, I mean, it wasn't flat out rejected. And it would seem to me that if the claim is being made that we are denying this based on timeliness at level two, that essentially the, the same argument would apply to everything at level one. Um, can someone clarify that point for me? No, I, I, the way I understood what you just said, I think you're correct. If the facts warranted a dismissal based on timeliness, then you would have expected to have seen a full dismissal for, on the basis of timeliness at the level one. Um, and I, I will admit some degree of... Um, Mr. Steyer, Mr. Beechler has a response. As okay, well. I'm sorry, Mr. Beechler. If I'd like to, I'd like to, if I may, just briefly respond to that with respect to testimony being heard at level one again in the record is the the Salinas versus McAllen case and it's got the, the language in there in the this Letta case and then there's the Van Independent School District case from the Texas Supreme Court in 2005 we dealt with that exact issue in fact in the Van case at level one and level two they had a full hearing and, and determinations were made and then at the board level they even heard the the evidence on the merits and then they dismissed it on untimeliness. And that's where the court, the Supreme Court, reiterated that these are jurisdictional issues. And, w and, and it, the bottom line is when it's a jurisdictional issue, it doesn't make a difference if a determination is made at another level, if evidence is taken at another level, if it's jurisdictional, then it can be dismissed at any point in the process. And our policy says that. Our policy says that timeliness can be brought up at any level of the process. And like I said, what happens at level one on these stop, look, and listen hearings is quite often the, the petitioner or the complainants will bring forth a complaint. And you, you listen at, at level one because you haven't heard and seen all the, all the testimony or seen the documentation, and sometimes that determination can't be made. So when, as it progressed to level two, and there was a review of the level one record and additional information taken at level two, that's when the determination was made that it's outside of the, the time frame. So the bottom line is it's can, jurisdiction can always be brought up. That's true in the school system. That's true in the court system. And am I correct in saying that our policy says that we may determine whether things are timely and yeah to be yes it does it does now when one other procedural issue that was brought in there um, the board certainly has the the right to make that uh, determination normally what happens in these types of appeals is that it goes back to the hearing officer that made the determination on timeliness so in this circumstance if as it was, it was dismissed based on timeliness at level two. The initial determination or the initial appeal would go back to Mr. Waxler. So we considered that and that was addressed in our, in our pre-hearing conference. 
but the determination was that the uh, Mr. McGivern and the complainants were going to rely on the record that was already in place. So that's why we're at level two, uh, level three on this instance. Normally, that goes back so parties can talk about these jurisdictional issues, and then it would come back to the board. But since we were relying on the record as it already existed, that's why we're here. Sure. I just want to say on the issue of remand, um, yeah, it's something that happens in the court context. Um, I could see how it might happen in the administrative context. The policy that we're dealing with here in community complaints is totally silent on the question of remand. Um, sometimes courts on appeal will reverse and remand so that trial courts can take on more evidence. But sometimes when the trial judge has really developed the evidence and gives a really um, full opinion in the alternative saying, well, even if you dis disagree with me on the jurisdictional issue, this is how I would have ruled, the court will reverse and uh, render and say that that's the judgment. You didn't hear any additional evidence here tonight. Uh, what the relief that we're requesting is that you implement the recommendations that Mel Waxler already made based on having heard hours of testimony, based on having racked up lots of man hours with representatives from the district. That's the relief that we're requesting, okay? So there's no reason to send it back. And just on the, the stop, look, and listen standard, that is the lowest bar possible that y'all have to satisfy in order to comply with the law, the lowest bar possible. Mel went above the lowest bar, okay? He dismissed for timeliness, and then he sent out an informal letter saying, okay, I dismissed you, but we are going to do a dozen, two dozen things. Um, there may be a thousand other districts that operate in a particular way, but, you know, that's also an opportunity to be a leader among those districts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Steiner. Mr. McGovern, I wanted to ask you one question. I, I'm just trying to seek clarity on, on my own part just so I, I know exactly where we're headed more than anything else. And, um, you know, I, I see the request that's been made. I just heard what you asked for. Um, but to me, the, it's like there's multiple levels here. I mean, things, very specific things that are being asked for in terms of, you know, some of the things that uh, Mr. Swanson has asked, asked for. I've heard him repeatedly tonight and <coughs> at, since the communication. Um, but there's also, to me, a higher level of uh, the way in which our, I'm gonna, I use the words community engagement process is done. Uh, I'm not really sure that that's the right way to do it because uh, to me it's really more community involvement where, you know, communities come together at the CAC level or the DAC level and you know, I, I, it may be an oversimplification on my part, but I mean, that's what I hear as the failure here, or at least the allegation of the failure. And, you know, I'm trying to find out, you know, are you just looking for specific items that are addressed here? The, the restorative justice part is an example, or I mean, are you really trying to get to a higher plane to, to do things? Well, you know, in our initial complaint, um, there were a number of remedies listed. And then as we went up higher, we narrowed those to what you're seeing right now. Um, in terms of uh, working with the community, uh, the really enlightening thing was juxtaposing the testimony of people who've had a lot of experience working with CACs with the testimony of folks like Joe Crumley, for instance, who can tell you how they're supposed to operate. And is, is a really interesting process of hearing, you know, well, things are going this way. Well, they're not supposed to go that way. They should call me if that happens. And so I think that these are kind of um, procedural mechanisms that go into place so that, you know, kind of on a macro level, on a day-to-day -day level, without requiring the attention of someone from one of these buildings, things are going to operate the way they should. So, for instance, um, you know, just giving people, um, you know, a sufficient time to prepare for trial is something that guarantees them their due process. Because, I mean, in theory, you could arrest someone and put them on trial the same day, but by guaranteeing in statute that they have at least, I think it's 40 days. I mean, on the whole, you avoid an awful lot of problems by kind of uh, couching the discretion of the judge by doing that. And so these specific requests, yes, it's what we're looking for, and they would kind of operate at a macro level saying that, you know, 
folks are going to receive information early enough that it'll be useful to them. It'll be written in a way that, you know, a person without a background in complex financial information can understand. Steve tells me that you might not know what's in the Bill of Rights. It was included um, in our material. Okay. Um, if I were a better attorney, I would have explained that already. Um, I believe that the easiest place to find it would be in Section D. My brief is Section 2 or Tab 2 in Section D, and it would be the addendum that comes immediately after the motion, which is four or five pages long? Nine pages long. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, the addendum itself is only a little bit over a page. So, yes, it's just those set of specific requests drawn almost, I mean, really verbatim, except for a couple of tenses, from the informal letter that Mel wrote, which is also an attachment to that motion. I think it was Exhibit C. So, actually, if you just flip to three and then flip back, you'll be right at the back of his letter. All right, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Ms. Barkdale. I have the same question for Mr. Beachler. Is that right? About the timeline? About what you uh, say is the, <coughs> the aggrieving event and the, and the timeline around it? It's on your power. I mean, and we have it, but if you could just summarize that for me again quickly. Well, there's a lot of issues that were brought forward, um, and, and I think you analyze each one separately. The policy says when you first knew of the event. So, if you look, for example, in the, in, the, in the level one complaint at some of the language in here, on page two, it says, we circulated an, an informal complaint to the board in August of 2012. And that informal complaint has these issues with respect to CAC, uh, Eastside Memorial High, all those issues are already in there. Uh, the document also re refers to says it was illustrated by the board, board's votes over the last year to force external management groups, not from Austin, into the Allen Elementary Neighborhood School and others. Also, AISD voted on uh, use of an external truancy program using GPS devices on students at Eastside Memorial High School at Johnston Campus. So if I have a complaint over that, you have, that's when your 15 days starts running. So if the complaint was the involvement of the CAC in the process, then that's when it started running, which is, that's why I generally just made reference to things over a, a year old. The last one, the, the closest is this August letter that was circulated, which has all these issues, which really served as the basis for this complaint. Again, I want to reiterate that the statements were made about September 24th coming to the board. Well, that's a self-imposed deadline. I can't stretch out a statute of limitations by just saying, well, respond to me in a month. Or if you don't respond to me in a month, that's the triggering point. It's when you first knew of the issue. So if you knew of the issue in August, let's say it was in August, and with excluding everything from prior to that time, that would be your triggering event. It's not the self-imposed deadline of September 24th. And I also want to reiterate that the letter did not say September 24th. The letter was sent and dated August 8th. The board members received it and it said they wanted to meet by August 26th and they wanted a response as to when that meeting was going to take place by August 18th. It wasn't September 24th. Now, I'm not saying that uh, they didn't come to the board on September 24th. I'm, I'm looking at when you knew or first should have known under the policy using reasonable diligence. So again, I, I, I want to emphasize the danger of going back in time on these things and how that opens up other types of complaints. Uh, Mr. Schneider referred to the policy saying May, and it, it certainly says May. It, it, it certainly says May, but if the board gets to the merits on this, then you've made that determination that basically it's timely, and then I, again, I just want to, I'm concerned about future grievances, whether it's community grievances, student grievances, employee grievances, are we setting a precedent? particularly since the issues were dealt with. What was being asked for, again, even if you get to the merits, my argument on that from the legal side would be mootness because they're asking for it to become part of policy. The recommendations are there. They're part of the administrative regulations. That was done informally, and I think the board needs to look at that and address that 
in terms of the, the issues that were brought forward. I agree that the issues that are brought forward are, are important and, and they're important for the community. And again, I, I respect everybody involved here and, and their involvement in this process. But are we gonna do it through the grievance process or are we gonna do it through another process? That's what we need to be looking at. Okay, a lot of this goes back to fairness. In terms of, I mean, what I heard sounded like a potential slippery slope concern. Page one of the administration's brief comments, as the administration has commented in other places, that this complaint, um, I'm reading from page one, is unique from other types of grievances commonly heard and considered by school districts. Now, that's something that distinguishes it from the sorts of cases that were cited to justify statute of limitations generally, which I mean, there's a good policy basis for statutes of limitations generally. Um, again, it goes to what's fair and what's efficient. If a teacher can go back and contest an appraisal from two years ago at, at any time, that's not efficient, all right? It's different from this case. When Mel Waxler was investigating this case, he talked to people about what was going on today. He brought in staff members, and there's a witness list from that hearing somewhere, about what was happening today, okay? So, I mean, this isn't a case where fairness you know, mandates a statute of limitations, and it's certainly not efficient. Thank you. Thank you. Finish. Okay. okay. Uh, Ms. Tosh. Um, help me understand, and I don't know to whom to address this, so if, it, if you happen to know the answer, um, please speak up. Um, how, if we decided to use that word may, and we decided to... Um, disagree with uh, the administration's decision, how would that help implement the relief that's being recommended by you? You said this is already, we've already said this is being done informally anyway by Mr. Waxler, so how would that help implement that relief, the, the uh, School Community Bill of Rights, for example? Ma'am, I will readily admit that I've never been a teacher nor worked in a school district, but based on my life experience in other contexts, and I think in many people's contexts, um, Practical, the practical matter of getting people in an organization to do something. I mean, as a basic matter, if you don't have a rule book that you can reference that's in your hands, if you don't know about a rule, um, you don't know to do it. I mean, if anything, think about fairness to the teachers that you're talking about. I mean, these are policies or principles or what have you that are buried in an administrative code somewhere about how to interpret some other policies which are hard enough to get to. Um, if nothing else, the relief that would be offered here would put something at people's fingertips. So, I mean, there's no power in a rule that nobody knows about, nobody knows that they're entitled to, and nobody knows to enforce. So that, that would be the difference. But if we're being asked to rule on an issue of timeliness, <clears throat> and we say that doesn't matter in this case, if we should happen to say that, if we, the majority, and it goes back to Mr. Waxer. How does that then ensure, going back to Mr. Waxer, he would have to review again and perhaps come up with the same decision. So how would that, that's, that's where I'm having a problem understanding how that would ensure that your relief being requested would be implemented. Okay, two part answer. Uh, one, I'm, I'm still not convinced that remanding it is a necessary or even a good uh, idea just because um, there's really, well, policy silent on remanding and there's no practical reason for remanding because I mean he doesn't need to gather more evidence I don't think he he looked at an awful lot I will readily agree that a lot of man hours went into this um, if however it were to be remanded to him I think procedurally what would happen is that his formal response which only cited untimeliness and didn't get into the rest of this would um, be null or void or overruled whatever word you'd like to use which would leave him with nothing else than the merits, which I think is what he referred to when he was making those recommendations. In fact, there is a line in his um, informal letter saying that all of these recommendations that follow, and I want to say it's on near the top of the second page, come are based on what I heard in these hearings. And so I think the practical effect is he would say, well, if it's not untimely, then I'm going to implement this. Thank you. Please. Which brings us right back to the point of mootness, if you're going to get to the merits. Because 
as I stated, the cabinet approved the administrative regulation BQB, which basically incorporated those recommendations dealing with the, the CACs. So if you're looking at the merits, it would come back again, it's, it, it's moot. Grievances are driven by the relief that's requested. If the relief is granted, there's nothing, there's nothing to give at that point. So again, I, when I read out of the brief, when you look at the level three appeals, they're asking for it, the recommendations in essence to become part of policy. Their administrative regulations, the way the policy manuals are built and the way they're interpreted is those administrative regulations um, implement policy. So again, it's, I, I think to answer your question, it comes back to, to mootness. Okay, let me let me. You get one shot at the at the apple, and then so, so I, I'll let you I'll let you do this. But I just want to we're starting to get to the point where we're debating this thing, and, and it's sort of getting a little out of hand. So I understand. I I apologize. I was just going to point out that um, if it's moot, if it were moot, then implementing the Bill of Rights into policy would cause no harm. I mean, if it's if the relief's already been granted, then doing this isn't going to harm anything. I don't think that's the case, though. I mean, I think that. You know, real life experience shows us that the, the more likely you are to see the rules, the more likely you are to follow them. If you don't know about them, you can't follow them. Thank you. Ms. Tice, are you? Okay. Ms. Ellens. Um, Mr. Beecher. Um, I was wondering if I could say, uh, say something. Not at, not at this time. I'm sorry. We'll, if, if, uh, let me just say that if your attorney wants to call you up, then, you, then we can. But. On the BQB regs, do you have a date when those were updated and when they might be available? I believe they're available now, and it's my understanding they met on uh, May 28th, I think, is when the cabinet met on that. So I believe they're in place. I know they've been working on them. They've been through the review process. Again, there's a lot of folks that were involved in that. But I believe that's, that's current now as of today. I'm sorry, the BQ? BQB, which are the administrative okay. regulations right. implementing okay. those recommendations. And so, um, and then your, the definition of, of the regulations, are tho those are the steps and the rules by which the administration acts. Implements the policy. Implements. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The BQB de uh, section deals with the campus advisory councils and all that type of thing. So these are just more definitive regulations in terms of how it's supposed to uh, how it's supposed to take place, basically, how those, how the CACs are supposed to operate, the training for members and updates and all that. So there's some good recommendations in there. Okay, thank you. Right. Ms. Moya. Well, I just wanted to add uh, to, in, to his response to Ms. Ellens, that the, or to, to clarify for Ms. Ellens, I think, that um, those regulations are not used just by central office staff. The regulations are used by all staff, so so it's not just you know I mean it's like an employee handbook that's probably this big. Okay. And just to, one other thing to add on that, like in a in a policy, it's part of the policy manual. So you have BQB legal, local regulations, exhibits. So they're they're all together, right. and to me that's all part of policy. Okay. Uh, if there are no more clarifying questions, then at this time, um, Mr. McGivern, you have three minutes for any closing remarks. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So, you know, Ms. Moy, are you ready for? So you may proceed, Mr. Gibbon. Thank you. You know, honestly, I think I've taken up quite enough of your time. Um, and I've reiterated my point several times, so I'll happily give my time back to the board. Thank you, sir. <laughs> this would be an appropriate time if yes. you want to. Can I give that time to Absolutely. Please? Thank you. That's what I was trying to suggest. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Um, the issue of timeliness is valid, but honestly, we're coming up on 10 months of constituents that
that all they wanted to do was have a brief meeting with the board back in August. It's now June and we're still trying to figure out whether or not they filed in time. Will you please think about what kind of relationship you want with the people of Austin. Do you want it perfect and litigious and harsh and reply by this date or we're going to sue your ass? Or would you rather have a professional kind of a thing? Or would you rather have amateurs, imperfect, conciliatory, and patient? Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. McGivern, if you're finished, then. There's no way I could have possibly said that Okay, better. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Beachler, you have three minutes for any closing remarks. Uh, are you ready? Uh, yes, sir. All right, Ms. Moy, are you ready? Okay, Mr. Beachler, you may proceed. Yeah, I'm going to do the same thing as Mr. McGivern. I think we've flushed these issues out um, sufficiently, unless anybody else has any questions. I think I'll give the, the time back to the board. Okay. I thank you for allowing me to speak tonight on behalf of the administration. I thank everybody uh, for being here. It, it's late, and um, we appreciate that you give this a serious consideration of, of the issue. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thanks for everyone being here. I want to, uh, first of all, express my appreciation to everyone, even those that did not speak, that uh, are willing to be here at this late hour. Um, at this time, um, the board will now deliberate on the matter. And I, I just have a question for you, Ms. Uh, Elizaldi, and, and I, I don't think it's necessary to go into executive session to ask this question. But I I see that what, what I put to me, at least, and this is just one board member, we have two different issues, quite frankly. One is the issue of timeliness, and I believe, I believe that needs to be dealt with in a certain way. And with all due respect to one of the speakers, we have rules and procedures because we have to follow the law, and that's why we have certain rules. Um, but there's also the issue of are there valid points that need to be considered? And so my question to you is if, um, we want to rule on the timeliness issue, but we also want to uh, continue to address uh, areas where we can improve in the district. Uh, can you summarize how that might look in terms of a motion or in terms of how it would fit into sort of the options? I do too. <laughs> I'm sorry? I, I just want to make sure that procedurally that if we want to pursue that, how that would how that would look, or how that would. And actually, I think the set the stage has been set for you to be able to do that. Both of the presentations acknowledge that there was a tremendous amount of discussion administratively and with members of the community. I think that's been accomplished. They both agreed. Both sides agreed that they'd spent many hours listening to testimony or listening to information, trying to flesh out some decisions that could be made jointly. Um, and you do have in, in your notebook, in that pocket, uh, the informal uh, decision that Mr. Waxler issued, which did grant, and Mr. McGivern acknowledged this, did grant many of the, or did carry out many, or promised to carry out many of the suggestions that had been made by this group. So even if you decided that the, and you have, of course, the regulations that are now So if you decided to affirm the level two decision, I don't think that means you're cutting out the community engagement piece. I think what it means is that your process stays in place. Excuse me, Chris, could you get to the mic, please? Sorry. I thought I was loud enough. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> I'll use, I should have used my teacher voice over there. Um, that one of the uh, one of the things that that everybody acknowledges in this room is that there was a whole lot of discussion about things to do better in terms of community engagement. There's been an acknowledgement that 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 things have changed, um, and so if you decided tonight to affirm the decision of Mr. Waxler at level two, I don't think that means 
that you're de you're uh, de denying any of the kind of improvements that have already been suggested and in fact put in your regulations, your new regulation that makes it more clear to your ad campus administrators how CAC should operate, right? And so uh, I think if you wanted to make it clear to your community that you want that process to continue, that you take community engagement seriously, I think you've already shown that by your actions. You have a new community engagement committee. You've got a new regulation that your staff has put in place. And you've been doing a lot of things, most notably the most recent, the most recent example, of course, uh, with regard to the, to the uh, arrangements at Eastside. So uh, by your actions, you've already done quite a bit of that, the, the things that have been requested. If you wanted to have a motion to affirm the level two decision, but encourage your administration or direct your administration to continue to pursue improvement in the community engagement area, I think that would be uh, a win-win. That's what I think. Okay, so that would not be out of, out of line with what we have. Okay, I just wanted to get that clarification before we started. Ms. Moya. Okay, well, I want to make a motion, and we'll see where we go, okay? Okay. So, um, I move to affirm the decision of the superintendent and deny the relief requested pursuant to the informal findings by Mel Waxler direct staff to imp implement regulations where appropriate and to bring policy recommendations to the board as appropriate. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Ellens. Okay, discussion on this motion. Yes, Ms. Uh, Inhosa. Uh, Trustee Moy, I appreciate that motion. I was thinking along the same lines, but a little differently. Um, so my motion would be to uphold the decision, uh, level two decision, and dismiss the matter on timeliness, but to divert the issue to our newly formed community engagement committee for priority review and consideration of the issue. Could we combine uh, both together? Because I think that, that one of the things I heard um, in the, um, the, the um, hearing tonight was a desire for, for board policy as well as regulation. And, and you know, it's not, a, it's not customary for the board to adopt regulation we don't normally vote on that, but um, we can certainly see it. Um, but I would, what I would, because I think what, what you're saying and what I'm saying are complementary. So uh, could we, could we add to, to, you know, at direction of the board to assign the appropriate, um, um, help me with the word, and to assign um, parts of maybe parts of the requ relief requested to to the newly formed board community involvement. What do we call it? Community, community engagement committee, or something like that. Because I don't. Because it sounds your motion sounds like we're taking this whole notebook and putting it in y'all's lap. And I, don't, and, and I don't think we need to put the whole notebook there, but I think there are things that need to go there. Well, I, th I think to Trustee Schneider's point earlier that there are some more global mm -hmm. issues that really that's what we're going to be grappling with mm -hmm. um, as part of our Community Engagement Committee and the issue of um, our CACs has emerged repeatedly as one of the issues to tackle. So I think, you know, I've been real frustrated with this whole process because what I've wanted to do all along is just pick up the phone and call Mr. Swanson or call Mr. Martinez and say, hey, can let me figure, is this what you want? Is this what we can do? And I haven't been able mm -hmm. to with this process, so I'm glad you were untimely, actually. <laughs> so we can take this to um, a different, uh, to, through a different process. But, what, but I think, um, but I'm grateful for this notebook of work that has been put together and done by, by our staff, by Mr. Beechler, by Mr. Uh, McGivern and um, Mr. Martinez and Mr. Swanson and others, so that we can figure out what exactly is the administration doing, how is that going to work, how is it complemented, uh, how can we
um, about the administration and um, and directing them to. What, what Let me that? say that again. Yeah, can you say that part again? Uh, pursuant to the informal finding by findings by Mel Waxler, direct staff to implement regulations where appropriate and to bring policy recommendations to the board as appropriate. Okay. Well, I mean, to if, if they've already got these regulations that they're um, that they that they have implemented, and this is actually this context is the first I've heard. Of that, we hadn't heard. I don't think in any other just in that memo any, that that it's in our pocket, right? Just here, yeah. Um, but I, I, to affirm that work, I think is important, and I'm very appreciative of it. Um, but I do think that there is a larger role for the board to play. So can we add? Some, I, I mean, I'm I'm perfectly willing to add something to this. Uh, to include um, the the uh, the work of the of the the new board committee because because um, we all know that a lot of this has been you know percolating for a long time we all know we all know about it and so it's we need to just get on it so can we just add um, and again I go back to some of the words I was saying before what what if we say your whole what if we say your whole motion and then add um, and and divert this issue to our newly formed community engagement pro uh, committee for priority review and consideration? So we're doing both. Yeah, I'm good with doing both. I just uh, what, but I don't know what this issue is. I mean, I don't, I oh. don't. I feel like it needs to be more defined. And so I'm looking for a different kind of word. Well, I see the Community Engagement Committee as defining it. I mean, that's what we're going to, we're at the very beginning. Our first meeting's tomorrow at 1215. You're more than welcome to attend um, in the board conference room. And that's what we're going to figure out. How about, how about if we say and in, in use uh, information provided uh, through this process to um, help shape the... Um, the work of the new of the board community engagement committee, or how? What do y'all think? I don't know. I'm thinking off the off the top of my head. Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna let Miss Chris, Chris had her hand up. I'm sorry. Okay, refer. 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 You're gonna have to go back to the mic. Is that? I know. I'm refer is what I was saying. R refer um, instead of divert. Y yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> refer the information provided to the engagement committee, or refer uh, whatever. Okay, well, that gets us started. I think. I and and I'm a, I, I know, Ms. Tysh, you want to say something, but let me say I, I actually think this should be referred first to the governance committee and then let the governance committee redirect the specific activities that relate to the community engagement or policy or, you know, may actually be calendar committee issues that need to be, uh, to need to address. It could be intergovernmental relations. I think one of the changes that's been suggested it involves <laughs> intergovernmental relations. So I actually think the most appropriate starting point is the governance, the committee, governance committee and the governance committee would redirect the different activities can, involved to the various committees. Can you explain why the governance committee? I don't understand that. Because the governance committee basically defines how the board will will carry out its work its work. That's the simplest, you know, it, it's it defines what we do, how we do it, and who will do it. Um Whereas community engagement should be, and since it's not even defined yet, you know, you're going to be working on your charter tomorrow. Um, we don't really know what the scope of that committee will involve. Okay. It's not going to involve policy. That's in the policy committee. It's not going to involve governance. It's not going to involve intergovernmental relations, which Mr. Snyder chairs. So, and I, and what I've heard from a number of different suggestions really crosses a number of our different committees. And so I think it would be, in my mind, more appropriate to refer it as a starting point to the governance committee and then let it direct it to the, uh, whatever the activities are, to the most appropriate committee to, to work with them. 
that that's my suggestion. So re refer uh, refer additional findings to the governance committee to be distributed to the to, be to assigned, other board committees. Yeah, to be assigned to other board committees as appropriate. I, I'm still not under, understanding. So tomorrow we have our first community engagement committee where we're going to, uh, on the agenda, is figuring out what it is that we are going to work on. So are we not allowed to, are we not entitled to do that until that, until the governance committee rules on that? No, no, no. You, you're, I, I thought what you were going to do first is to define your charge. What is it that you're going to do? How, you know, how often are you going to meet? What, you know? We, well, we've submitted that uh, to you. I haven't seen anything. Okay. So, so maybe I need to resubmit it. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, if you have, I haven't okay. seen it, so I apologize. But, okay. But that's the first thing is what, what is your charge? How often are you going to meet? What, what's the scope of your work? Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I would, I, once again, I, I, I just see a, a number of suggestions that have been made. and. And, you know, I want to thank Mr. Swanson and Mr. Martinez for all the work that they have done to come up with these ideas. But I just see them not just being policy, not just being community engagement, uh, that they're co it covers a lot of stuff. And I just want to make sure that we don't lose more time, you know, directing them to a committee that it's not really your charge or uh, this should be another committee's activity or and, and then we lose time, I guess. But and let me just just so I have a uh, more clear understanding and make sh to make of what you're saying. So, um, if the community engagement committee was working through an issue and decided, well, this really needs to be a change of policy, let's re we wouldn't then just refer that to policy committee. No, you, you theoretically you should send it back to the officers, to and the officers would make sure that what you're suggesting is that it should go to policy. Okay. Okay, so cap, how about this? So I'm not gonna repeat what I said at the first and just say add and refer additional suggestions to the governance committee to be assigned to other board committees. That's appropriate. What do you think? I do think it should get priority consideration though. I, I would like to see that part of it. This issue should get priority consideration by the governance committee. I, th I don't, I don't oh. want it just to languish is what I'm I don't think it will. Saying. Do you I'm feel like it needs to be in the, in the motion? Well, yeah, I don't think priority consideration is specific enough to say that it has to be considered at the next meeting, but I think, you know, it, we work on a lot of things for this board and not by intent. Things sometimes get put on the back burner. So I, I think it's important um, that it is dealt with Okay, Cheryl has their hand up. Miss Bradley. I've, I've read the Bill of Rights and I started thinking back to two superintendents ago and that's somewhat of how the CACs operated about two superintendents ago. But the one thing that we have not discussed and, and I know it's not basically, and I probably should ask you if I could say this or not, so maybe I need to is can I ask you and, and I'm, I'm sorry Miss Bradley can I ask you to hold your thought I, I apologize Miss Tysh it's really yeah it, 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 well no no it's not it well to me it's not okay you, you please it's you, you're I was gonna say my concerns have been aired by other board members and so I'm, I'm good thank okay. you I, and I apologize That's way to go. okay so now we're back to Miss Bradley if she's ready and if not while they're talking is there anyone else that has a comment Mr. Snyder, I know you always have a comment. I always have something to say. Right. Um, a lot of my concern about this motion, uh, whether it's from Ms. Hinojosa or Ms. Moya, um, is that I was chair of the DAC in a past life, pushing back a decade ago now. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have... I, I've seen the way our DAC operates. I've seen the way the CACs operate. I'm intimately familiar with much of the stuff you cited about Eastside, and we could go back to Pierce, and um, even some of the other tribulations that we've had before. And I'm absolutely convinced that it's not that staff does not understand policy. 
It's not that staff does not know what regulation is. It's not that our campus folks, whether it's you know central or campus or whatever, uh, they they know how those organizations are supposed to be constructed, how they're supposed to be organized, how what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, there's no lack of clarity there at all. I mean, I have absolutely no doubt about it. So I'm struggling to figure out exactly what sending this back to staff to, to make sure they understand is going to get anywhere. And, you know, I, for me, myself, on the timeliness issue, I, I think it was timely. And it also says very clearly in board policy, we may. We, we can say, it's a day late, two days late, two months late. We, we may go ahead and address things. Um, but to me, there's a, a bigger fundamental question about how we're going to make sure our, our CACs and the DAC function the way that they're supposed to. And we have had that discussion that we need to talk about that on this dais, down there on the floor, for years. And it hadn't been done. And, you know, I'm struggling to see how passing a motion like you're trying to construct here is actually going to move things further down the road rather than just we're going to go back in the committee and we're going to talk about it and we're going to hope that something better turns out. That's basically what it comes down to. I mean, I, I've got to be honest. I mean, I, I don't agree with some of the recommendations that you guys have come up with. I would be glad to sit down and talk with you about them, maybe come up with a different solution, do things in a different way. But to me, the fundamental question is how do we engage the community and the governance of our schools? And, you know, that's the discussion we've all said that needs to happen, and it still hasn't happened. So, um, you know, if we can come up with something that says, you know, we're going to commit to having this discussion post haste, get it done, get it enacted, you know, change the way we do things and do what the law requires, I mean, great, I'll support that. But, um, I'm not real interested in something that just goes back and asks staff to clarify regulation, clarify policy, knowing that they already know what policy is. They already know what the regs are. They already know what the law is. And we're just simply not forcing ourselves to do what we're required to do. Ms. Bradley, are you ready? <laughs> well, I don't particularly have a question anymore. But Ms. Elizade helped me with that, but I'm just going to say I ditto with ditto Mr. Schneider's remarks. Uh, I don't believe that where we are right now is going to get us to where we need to be. I just don't believe that. I believe we're going to end up being in this cycle, a continuous little cycle, until we address it in the manner that it should be addressed, and this is just not it, which doesn't bring forth the motion, yeah. but I'm just saying, it's just not going to get us anywhere, and I just, I just think this is... Uh, Ms. Boyle. Ms. Bradley, are you saying that this forum that we're in is not going to get us where we need to be, or are you saying that, um, um, that we need to, that we need to handle these issues like the CAC and how they operate and all that jazz in a, in, in a different kind of board um, uh, meeting in which we could, we would specifically direct staff to set up certain kinds of um, reporting schedules or certain types of, some way for us to monitor um, that, or to monitor and or and to to ensure that that um, and since we're talking about CACs that the CACs and the DAC are operating as it's they are supposed to. Um, I mean, I'm not quite sure if I understand. I'm trying to figure out what you meant exactly. Well, I think maybe I'm not sure if I stepped out of what we're supposed to be ruling on, but. Uh, 
I agree with Robert that when I look at the Bill of Rights, I don't. it's not particularly the fact that I don't agree with it. It's the fact that I don't see where it will get us to where we need to be. Uh, I believe that there are deeper conversations that need to be had. I believe that there are definitions that need to be made, and the Bill of Rights do not do that. Uh, I think we all know what... I think we all have a feeling of what we want our CACs to look like on all campuses, but we also must acknowledge that some of our campuses are doing that. And so we cannot sit up here and have this type of, of, of a, 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 I guess, a, a function that speaks to an entire district when all of our, you know, with some of our campuses function the way that they should, and may, and some of them do not. So, you know, uh, I just do not believe that the Bill of Rights speaks to that. And, and I, I believe that as a board, we can, we can, looking at, looking at the state law as it is written, define what the expectations that we should have for our campus advisory councils. And Robert is right. We have talked about this time and time again, but we also must acknowledge that this, that, uh, this happened uh, with previous superintendents too. So we do not need to just leave it in the lap of one because we have done that unfairly in my opinion. So this has, this has been an ongoing thing pre superintendents ago. Uh, but I do believe that this is just not the right way to do it. So can we can we move forward with with this motion and then maybe afterwards after that can we have a conversation or at least make some suggestions on on um, content of upcoming board meetings or an additional um, retreat to talk about this or to, to you know to, to set up some to make things change just I mean to make things change not just talk about it but to actually do something to make it change. Yeah, and, that, and that's why, once again, that's why I say I think the governance committee is the best place to start because things that need to be directed to the calendar committee as a, you know, we need to talk about versus community engagement committee versus policy, you know, we, we can prop appropriately okay. assign those, those tasks. Uh, Ms. Barksdale and then Ms. Teich. I was looking for clarification from Trustee Bradley about what the this is and that this isn't the right thing or the right thing to move us forward to where we want to be. Is it this, the remedies and uh, such, um, requested or relief requested in the, the case we're looking at tonight or is it moving forward with the committee or I, I just was looking for what the this is in your, in your statement. The this is uh, the remedy requested. I do not believe it's going to get us where we need to be. I, I, I am willing to agree with Mr. Torres that we can take it to the governance committee. We have an ad hoc committee for everything else. We can have an ad hoc committee about, uh, for this where we are actually uh, really, really working at doing the right thing as it, as it looks like for Campus Advisory Council. Something that should have been done a long time ago. So this is just not, you know, this is, it, it really isn't new. Ms. Uh, Tice, I'm sorry. I think what you're asking for, Ms. Bradley, is some kind of an accountability procedure. And so could I suggest that we put a date in this motion by which time the governance committee will take up this matter? Would that help in confining this? And it's kind of amorphous right now. And I think some of our fears, uh, and I agree with Mr. Schneider and Ms. Bradley, some of the fear is that it will just drag on and it will not get attended to. So if we could put a date in suggest what, 90 days from now that the government's governance committee have um, reviewed the policies that are, are the regulations that have already been mentioned tonight and that we start check looking into whether or not you know we can develop some kind of an accountability system so that we can re get reports from the schools as to how these CICs are operating or use the DIC the DIC right now is to me is just a, a body that just receives reports perhaps it, it can be given more powers Uh, Ms. Did you? Yeah, I'm sure I'm just dense, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I still don't 
understand governance committee to getting this because I mean, there's so many different issues that come up. Is the governance committee going to go through each one of these and say, this committee gets that, this committee gets that, this committee gets that? In my mind, community engagement's already going to deal with CAC. Why wouldn't the community engagement committee get it, make recommendations, send it to the officers, and then the officers divvy it up? What? Because I'm still trying to understand what your charge is. <laughs> okay. So it's just a matter of... Because we haven't, because we haven't even had our first meeting, right? And so you don't know what we're doing, right? Yeah. Uh, Miss Bradley, just a uh, suggestion. What if there's an ad hoc of board members that work with the DAC executive committee or what have you? Uh, and I'm looking at Mr. Schneider <laughs> when I'm saying this. You can help me out with this. Uh, well, Ms. Yeah, Bradley, I had a similar idea. Let me, let me tell you what I'm thinking, and okay. then you can tell me to sit down and go away. Okay. Um, but I also view this as an ad hoc committee. I, I don't agree with the, the governance part, simply because, to me, it's about the governance committee should be about board governance. Mm -hmm. And this, to some extent, is community engagement, but it's also to a larger part, um, at least my view, is a larger part of community involvement and complying with state code and making sure that our CACs and, and the DAC are doing what they need to. And I, I think it was Ann that made the point that the DAC just sits back and takes reports. Um, that, it was that way 10 years ago, I can tell you that. And, you know, they, they have started looking at committees to do things, but I'm not really sure that they're doing anything more than just looking at issues. I mean, I, I've yet to see a report come from the DAC that says, you know, your district level site-based decision-making committee says that, you know, you really ought to take a look at this, whether it's funding, east side, charters, you know, name it, you know, I haven't seen anything at all from them. So, um, you know, what, what I think we need to do is just have a ad hoc committee, not anything permanent, I hope, um, that looks at that organization, makes sure that they are complying with what state code says, what our policy and regulations currently say um, about you know the way that they should be structured, the way they should operate. Um, maybe implement some kind of reporting rhythm where we know that um, you know if a CAC really has ten members that they really have 10 members and it's not just the CAC and the principal and you know I've, I've seen too many of those where it's CAC of two or three people so um, you know I agree with Ms. Bradley that you know it ought to be some kind of ad hoc committee that puts together things we may rely upon the community engagement people to go out and you know if we need to get better involvement at a particular campus it's a task that maybe the community engagement committee ought to consider but that's kind of what my thinking is on a way to move forward from here. So can we vote on the motion? I'm sorry? Can we vote on the motion? <laughs> is, well, and then deal with all these we... other issues outside well, the motion? Well, I, I thought your motion involved who it would be referred to or I who. still have governance committee down here. Okay. Yeah. Um. I, I would actually like to add some amendments to the motion, like what we just described in terms of the creation of an ad hoc committee to ensure compliance of our advisory councils. Does it have to be part of this motion or can it be a separate motion later? I think it should later? be because, like, I, I mean, you know, I'm not sure I'm real wild about the current motion. You know, with, about what? About the current motion. I mean, simply because, you know, we can do one thing, but I mean, we're not, obligated to do anything else. I mean, the only thing we're posted for is to act on this particular item. So, um, you know, the way I look at it is if we're going to make an additional motion, it's going to have to be directly related to this item in some well, way. Well, but couldn't we, couldn't we um, um, give a bunch of suggestions to the officers to, to go back, to go, to go and, and, um, Put together, you know, some type of, of schedule or a scope of work on how we're going to get all this work done 
um, and then to, and develop any ad hoc committees that need to be developed or um, I mean, couldn't sure. we do that? I mean, I know that, I mean, in these kind of, of scenarios, in these kind of circumstances in which we are in right now, you know, we, if we have something else that we want to get done, we direct the superintendent or staff to go back and do something and report back to the board. Um, so why wouldn't we do the same thing here and say, okay, you know, we've heard all these things, there's all these things that came to the top that have been kind of percolating right under the surface for a long time. So let's, Let's direct, you know, the board officers or whoever uh, to to take all of the information that we've got, that we've contributed tonight and put together a plan of action on how the board's going to move forward. You know, in the meantime, the community engagement committee meets and starts putting their charge together, and uh, because the board's going to have to vote on that anyway, and then um, and we start we start putting this, you know putting the ingredients together to bake this cake. So, so let me let me suggest then that why don't if if you if we want to amend the motion but uh, to suggest that it be assigned to the officers to create an ad hoc committee if that's what uh, the will of the board is um, to address the requirements uh, to address some of the issues raised in in the hearing tonight. Um, in officers instead of governance? Yeah, instead of governance. In other words, if we're going to create another committee, then that committee needs to be created by, by the, the officers. Right. Okay. Before we do that, can we make sure we have board members willing to serve on that ad hoc committee? Sure, Robert. Looks like there's at least Robert said he's going to chair it. <laughs> I didn't recall that discussion. Miss <laughs> uh, Miss okay. Ellens and then Miss uh, Bradley. So there's three. Well, I did just. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, I did just um, want to point out that it actually we are um, slated to discuss this on June 12th at the officers meeting um, the, about the campus advisory councils and the district advisory committee right so that could happen as early as Wednesday um, we don't have a board governance meeting slated for the, this month it's in August right so if we can address it in officers I think that makes sense you know the, the the problem with an, an ad hoc committee or anything but is it's going to have to one we're going to find out who wants to be on it it's going to take yeah. a little bit of time to and then by the time we get it posted we it may take a little bit longer but yeah um miss miss bradley i will be more than happy to serve on the ad hoc committee all right so it looks like we got a chair <laughs> Mr. Torres, I would be more than happy to serve. <laughs> I, I heard serve. chair there. Okay. Um, any other comments? I I, I, I want to talk about the timeliness issue. I, I think it's quite clear that this was not a, t a timely filed um, uh, grievance. And the reason being is I was on the board when the letter came in August, and it mentioned these things. And I'm sorry, Mr. McGivern, I have to respectfully disagree with you. Um, I received that letter. I responded to it. I even had it on my calendar until the day of the meeting that was set up, and I had agreed to meet with him. So I really do not appreciate the characterization that no board member responded to the request because I did, and I was told there was, the meeting was canceled. So I, 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 I can assure you that there was a letter. It happened in August, and that was the first time that these things actually came to mind. So with that personal uh, 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 involvement, I can tell you that this was untimely filed. So I don't, I don't have a problem with that. That doesn't mean that the issues that were raised are not important, that they're not true, that we don't need to act on them. That's why I was asking the question that I first raised. Two different issues here. Doesn't mean one has to nullify the other. Um, and like Mr. Snyder, I, I think there's some things that I couldn't support, but, but we can't let perfection be the enemy of the good. We, we have to begin to work on those things that we know we can work on. And, and so, and, and we know we're not perfect. Um, and so we need to just start chipping away at these things in some way. So um, I'm, I, I, you know, I will support this motion with regard to timeliness. Um, I, I think the most appropriate thing as I'm thinking of this is probably sending it to the officers to create this ad hoc committee if that's what the, the board wants to do and that we move forward with that 
uh, that uh, approach is, you know, unless there's any further discussion, Mr. Steiner. Can we put a deadline on the formation and um, activities of this committee so that, I mean, we, we know it gets done, we know it gets started and moving, not, not insinuating that, you know, you guys are going to let it slide or anything. It's just that, you know, I, I really want to make sure this happens and it doesn't fall into the crack of, you know, two years from now we're having the same discussion. Well, as chair of this committee, Mr. Snyder, I'm sure I, I can assure you that. Oh, you're appointing Miss Bradley chair. That's what, what I heard. Co chair. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, can can we put a deadline of, let's say, middle of August in terms of, you know, having an initial report and recommendations back? I mean, I know the CACs have already been formed for next year. And, um, you know, a lot of it I would like to see implemented during the fall so that we know that things are working during the fall. And, and, and let me let me tell you, and I, and I know we have another engineer in the audience, so I will uh, say that, you know, in, in our world, you have quality assurance and you have quality control. One tells you what you would like to do to maintain things, and the other one is where you actually check things. And I think that's what we need to, we as a board, and that was why I've, I felt the board needs to own this, because part of the recommendation is that you need to have le the leadership involved in it. And that's why I felt having the Board Governance Committee oversee that all of the issues that we're, we're talking about or addressed needed to begin with the board and be overseen by the board. But I think that's where we, we have the issue is the quality control part of what we're doing um, is not ensuring that whatever organization is not um, uh, verifying that the work is, is, is occurring the way you want it to be assured uh, at every campus or at every uh, level in the district. And so we need to have that quality control element added to the work uh, that, the, that the board generates. But I think it's important that the board, uh, because this is the way we can provide leadership, we really can't, as some of the recommendations, be out on every campus. We just do not have that kind of time. But we can set up the structure to ensure that the intent of what is desired here is implemented, and to the extent that we can be there, we will be there, but we just can't simply be at every campus. Uh, particularly our at-large at <laughs> members, you know, can't expect them to be at all 120 campuses um, every day of the week, so. Um, For those of us who have full-time jobs. Yeah. So we need to set up a system that provides the quality control to ensure that what we're expecting to occur is actually occurring and being done the way we expect it to be done. So. Okay. Okay, so let me try to rephrase this thing. All right. <laughs> All right. So, I move to affirm the decision of the superintendent and deny the relief requested. However, pursuant to the internal findings, informal findings of Mel, by Mel Wax, Waxler, direct staff to implement regulations where appropriate and to bring policy recommendations to the board as, appro as appropriate and uh, refer additional suggestions and concerns raised at this meeting to the board officers to be assigned to other board committees. To be assigned to a, an other ad hoc. board committees. Is it? Go ahead, Ms. Tysh. I thought you were going to refer it to a specific or create a specific ad hoc committee to deal with this. So I think we exactly. need to probably change that last, just those last words. Well, but I, I agree. Okay, I thought the ad hoc committee was just going to deal as one <coughs> part of the big community engagements that's in this notebook. So I thought it was other board committees and because if, if it says other board committees and the officers can create one, right? Well, I, I, I would agree more with what Ms. Tice said that in that we're gonna create an ad hoc committee and if other committees are needed, we'll, we'll do that. But I think the spirit here is uh, that we create an ad hoc committee specifically for this purpose. Ms. Helens. Okay, so now I need clarification. So you are, <laughs> this is, is sounding kind of um, uh, bureaucratic, if you will. The way that Lori had written it before allows, in my opinion, um, just, yeah, if y'all may get in the officers committee and realize that the community engagement committee is the place for it, or you may not, if we, if we limit ourselves to have the, having this ad hoc committee you're back to the initial 
motion that limited it from going to policy, from going to in intergovernmental. I mean, I think if we add in the ad hoc wording, I'm, you've, you've confused me, I guess is it. So you're gonna, ha rather than the officers deciding where it goes, you're gonna assign everything to the ad hoc committee, right. not just the CAC, DAC part. Right, and then that committee would determine which, what goes to community engagement, you know, Robert Snyder being the co-chair will deal with the DAC issues. Um, you know, that committee would be the, the central point of making sure that the work gets divided up to various committees. And that was going to be done by the middle of August, which well, is what I, I, Robert said. Mr. Snyder wanted to add a deadline, so I'll, I'll see what kind of deadline he was looking for. My understanding was they were going to just do the DACCAC part, which is back to the original problem is you have policy, calendar, I mean, all these other things. So the ad hoc committee was specific to DACCAC versus what Lori's motion right now gives that to the so, so you were only limiting the ad hoc committee to DAC issues? No. Okay, no? so I'm confused. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I, I, I thought you were talking about the whole enchilada. I, to, to me, it, some ideas will be formed in terms of, you know, how to deal with these broader issues. And Mr. Schwartz, I think you're right that, I mean, you know, it's not gonna be up this to this committee to-, to I'm sorry, would you say that again? I don't hear that too well. <laughs> Not the same amount I hear, probably. <laughs> um, you know, the, this, the ad hoc committee would not determine how to do the community engagement. Right. We would go to right. community engagement to do community engagement. If there were policy things that were dug up, and, you know, I frankly don't think there will be, but, I mean, possibility may be there, goes to the policy committee. Okay. I mean, that, that's the way I envision it. And, and to address the middle of August thing, the only thing that I would really like to get in place is some kind of idea on, you know, how we're going to hold everyone, board, staff, campuses accountable for making sure that at least the CACs and the DACs are doing what they ought to starting this fall. Okay. And Cheryl wants to. Ms. Bradley. Then at that point, we have to be careful because when I was looking at it, because at some point I would think that there would be a policy some type of a policy formation on it somewhere, somewhere. But you have to be careful because you don't want to step in, step over into operations. So we would have to be very, very careful that we, we drew a charge or drew a line that did not step into operations. Sure. sure. Okay. I mean, I'm trying to rewrite this because now I heard something different. Um, so we'll leave the first part about affirming the decision, blah, blah. And then, um, and then and direct the board officers to create an ad hoc committee to address the um, additional suggestions and concerns raised at this meeting. Does that cover it? Yeah, repeat Really? That. Okay. I have a lot of scratching out here. Let me see. Let me put my glasses on. Um, all right. I move to affirm the decision of the superintendent and deny the relief requested um, and direct the board officers to create an ad hoc committee to address the additional suggestions and concerns raised at this, midi, at this meeting can I suggest, be assigned to other board committees. Rather than this meeting, can I say through this hearing process? Okay, because yes, that, raised at, raised. Through this hearing process? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, through this hearing process to be assigned to other board committees as appropriate. Okay. Ms. Tice. And then to the, to the issue of the deadline, said, said ad hoc committee to report to the board by August third week in August, fourth week, what, what do you think? September. Beginning of September. <laughs> I'm sorry? September 1? We don't meet in July, remember? Yeah, we don't meet right, so by September, September? 
by September, the first week of September? Sure. Okay. Okay. And Ms. Ellens, are you okay with the modification? You, you were the seconder of that motion? Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Motion passes 8-0 by everyone on the dais. Okay, uh, at this point, I want to once again express my appreciation to all of the parties here. Um, I, I, once again, I understand and I think the board understands the intent and, and once again, we want to reaffirm the fact that we're all here for the same purpose and that's to help our students succeed and to the extent that we can work together rather than working apart uh, or contrary, uh, that's the most ideal situation. So thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Elizalde, thank you very much. Board members, thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes. We are adjourned. <laughs>